Hello, Professor. There is no audio. Hello, Professor. We can't hear you.
Hello, Mike. Can you hear us? Hello, Mike, your, your microphone is off. Sorry, can the rest of the online students hear me? Yeah. Yes, Professor. Yes, your voice. I'll see what I can do. But the lecture is supposed to start at 11, no? Uh, no, no, actually, Professor starts it 10 minutes before that, so. Okay. Starts at 10.50 regularly, but... Uh, he informed he... us that before. Okay.
sorry for that. Um, just if you see there is a chat, and if they claim that they I can now it 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 works. Kazan, does it work now? Yeah. Yes, uh, Mike, but uh, it hasn't worked from the start. Can you hear us now? Uh, I, I I just uh, said I just make a short repetition. This is no no short. problem. Uh, but uh, Gerard, can can you please turn on? the sound of the notification in in mike's webex because this was originally the plan that sometimes if the audio goes off or something then when we type a message you would get a sound alert because of course you cannot see it yeah, while you are giving a lecture this would be good. This would be good. so gerald knows you should uh, turn on just the sound of the notification because usually nobody writes so you will only get a, a notification in in case of an emergency See. Don't do it now. We do it after. Okay. Okay. Works. I just say we made we made an example. Yeah, here for so-called alternate mark inversion. And the goal of this auto the goal of this alternate mark inversion is just if you have a stream which only consists of binary ones and zeros, the ones and zeros are statistically independent. Yeah, and same probability. Then we want to ensure with this alter, with this alternate mark inversion. That um, at once are uh, this alternating sign, so as plus one and minus one. This means after the encoding, you get a so called pseudo ternary code, which is zero mean. Pseudo ternary, all this pseudo ternary, there is no new information here, the sign of this. Yeah? Always, if the original bit is a one, yeah, you get either plus or minus one. And um, uh, dependently on the number of zeros between these ones, yeah, get an alternating sign, as you can see from one. Sure, this data stream is zero mean. You can uh, obtain this uh, a stream by this, um, say, uh, you first do a differential and this differential encoding just says, yeah, um, if um, um, bit is a one bit in the original data stream, you change the state of a differentially encoded. And if the original bit is zero, you don't change this state. So here you transmit a zero, and you don't change the state from if the state is one, you transmit a zero in the original data stream, so you still transmit a, zero, a one in the differential encoded. Originally, zero, you don't change the state. Here you transmit a one, and now you switch from one to zero. So this means, if I take a look at the differentially encoded, and if I say here is a change, yeah, it's a diff um, a differentially encoded bits, yeah, I can I know the original bit basically. Then the coding which we are, where we are interested in is just then we take the difference of the current differentially encoded bit and the previous bit. And you see this works. And then we said, okay, we just take a look first at the auto function of these differentially encoded bits. This is quite simple because the value at m equal to zero, this is always the second moment of this process. Yeah, then if neighborhoods are statistically in the this is still the case because we um, haven't introduced any redundancy of this differential encoding. There's the same as information as before. So differential, even differentially encoded bits are statistically independent. Then this value is just the mean value to the square, as you know. The mean value, zeros and ones is one half, the square is one by four. Then we said, how can we obtain the function of our code? So we substitute here this xn by bn, so on. In an expression where we stay based on the autocorrelation function of the original, actually encoded bits, we can 
expression function of the AMI code. Ended up now um, in expression function, which looks like this. Now we can draw a figure. It's like this. So we have removed, see, as expected. And uh, so check if this makes sense. Yeah, so first value is still one half of this phi is x of m. Why? Because then I check the, uh, that there is no sound. Yeah. Second moment of the different uh, of the AMI code uh, data stream is still one half. Zero to the square plus or plus one to the square. The expected value is just one half. But the next value here it's not 1 by 4, it's minus 1 by 4. This value here, minus 1 by 4. All the other values are 0. It's just because our process is 0 mean. So now we get a new equation function. Basic goal of this AMI code is uh, basically to shape the spectrum. Later we take a look at the so-called um, power spectral density. So this is m equal to 1. Two, three, five, six, and so on. And this is, of course, minus uh, two, two, three, four, and so on. Now, even if we wouldn't do this technical uh, the, or this this approach here in the pseudo ternary symbols, we could, if we take a look just here at the idea, to obtain the autocorrelation fan. Because if you say zeros and ones have the same probability, you could say, okay, at least the value at n equal to zero is easy to find. This is one. Then you say, now I switch to m equal to one, a shift of one. And then you think about the problem. What is the probability that originally have two adjacent ones? It's one by four. Because one times zero and zero times one and zero times zero gives always zero, and then um, one times one would originally give one by four. But now adjacent bits, yeah, uh, adjacent symbols, have always a different sign. So this means instead of plus one by four, I get minus one by four. This happens in one by four of all cases are multiply either plus one with minus one or minus one with plus one. So, and now, uh, if we introduce a change by two uh, index uh, is equal to two, yeah, then in, um, let's say, um, in one by four of all cases, originally, let's say this is, happens here, we have uh, ones. But in one by eight cases, there is a, um, these two ones have the same sign, and in one by eight cases, these have different size signs. For instance, here they have different size in this example. Yeah? Um, uh, two bits which have a distance of two. But statistically, yeah, the same happens if you have a distance of two in the shift. Yeah? Shift is two. You also have minus one times minus one. This is just an excerpt. And therefore, the autocorrelation function here disappears for m larger or equal than zero. So, and uh, the next question is, um, what happens with uh, whites and stationary processes if you introduce filtering? Now I show you, of course, you may have seen this. Um, this. Uh, medical expression is written here and by a digital field. This is nothing else than a, um, the purpose of a digital field. So we add actual input, subtract the previous input. This is exactly what an writes as, um, say, as the function, and we can say we can also. So realize AMI coding, pseudo ternary coding, yeah, by means of a digital field.
and just draw you the inputs response of this digital filter. This is quite easy to understand, I think. Um, filter only needs a memory depth basically of one. Yeah. So, and it says, okay, takes the actual sample. So this is what we see here. This is GN. Impulse response of our filter. This is the time in Xn. Takes the actual input. And then it takes the previous input. Let's say we, I write it here. It's N1. All the other. This is a first order filter. Yeah. Because it has only one memory, first order digital, then it takes the previous input and weights this input with minus one. This is quite easy to understand. So it makes exactly what we have to, it's a mathematical expression, yeah. So it could look like this if we draw a fire, let's say. Differentially in copets, BN. Then two branches. One is a direct path, direct, it's weighted with one. This is this one. Yeah. This is the index here, what you see here. And then there is a delayed path, Let's say, introduce here a memory one. I usually this is written as z to the power of minus one. Have you seen this? Z to the power of this is just z transform, but it it's, it's nothing else than a register. Yeah. Register. It's every clock, yeah. Um, the input just is delayed by one. It's quite quite easy. Yeah, just write register. So and then we weight this output with minus one. So the previous bit, what we get here is pause. Then we add both. Put the previous expression. Beginning of the lecture, just in a figure. This gives x. Pause. You can describe the output of this digital filter as xn is equal to n. Now we need to do the, con the impulse response. Or let's say I just write it vice versa. The input is uh, our differentially encoded. And in our case, this is quite simple because in our case, this is just, um, let's say, or I write it as a sum, yeah, sum um, goes from to one because this gn has only two uh, values and this is g b minus k. So, and this gives it in our case nothing else than g naught. This is g naught. So of the impulse response at the time zero, or the time index zero, and this is just one, then uh, times bn. So we wait this g naught, and plus this is exactly what we want to, which gives, because our g's are plus and minus one, This is a digital filter. Now the question is, this is the motivation of this question, what happens with whites and stationary processes and LTI systems, so linear time invariant systems, which are filtered, which, which can be um, basically considered as filters. So this is the next uh, subsection, so 2.1. Wide sense stationary processes. TI systems, time invariant systems. 
is this term is not as general as us. Yeah? So we describe these linear time invariant systems by the impulse response and the time. And at the moment, we are only interested in this impulse response. So what we want to discuss is, what we basically want to find is, now I just write here xn, but I show you this case. Yeah? You can do it as you want. This is, of course, a sequence, yeah? what we consider. And this sequence yeah, gives the input of this filter. But usually, if you take a look at books, yeah, even in, in our case, I usually write here only xn, but it means there is not only a single xn, it's a sequence of all input things. Yeah? And then, but, but now we make it general. Uh, what comes out is yn. So these are concrete realizations. So the, the input is xn, the output is yn. Basically, we are basically interested, in, of course, what happens if we know the autocorrelation xn with autocorrelation but we start with a cross-correlation function because this enables us to find the autocorrelation function of yn at the end. So we can say yn, this is just the mathematical description, is just the convolutional product of our discrete impulse response. It's a discrete time impulse response. And we need to do the convolution. It's the input signal of this. And this is, uh, above we had an example. So this is like the tau you may know from the continuous time convolution. This is like this tau, right? It goes from minus infinity to infinity. Yeah. We don't need to uh, restrict our attention to cultural filters. They may be even non-cultural. Then gk, this is like g of tau times x of t minus tau, and this is n. So this is the discrete convolution. We start with the cross-correlation function. Cross-correlation function. We didn't introduce this, but now I don't take a look at the autocorrelation function of xn's. I take a look at the cross-correlation function of cross, means two different processes, yeah, of x and y. And we just need this to find the autocorrelation function. So we define x, y, so this is the cross correlation, yeah. So li the linear dependency between the input values and the output values for a shift. So you know, we use, need to use this expected value of x n, y n, x m. Now we compare two different processes. We can write this as the expected of x n. Yn is just the filtered version of Xn. But now I need to write capital letters because I'm interested in what happens on average. So I write this as we know. Here's the uh, equation for Yn. So this is sum. K goes from plus infinity. Maybe later we just write over all K. You, you know it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, and then we write here g k g k times x, but now we are interested in y n plus m, and therefore we need here to take a look at n plus m, right? Because here it's a shifted version of y, so we write here n plus m plus k. This is what we need to look. Yeah, and now we can say this is the same as, now let's put this xn, the sum. So we write this is the same as expected well of sum, and now I use this approbation for all k. So this gk is deterministic. Maybe I write it here. This is deterministic. Because it describes our filter impulse response. This is not random, therefore it's lowercase. GK times XN times XN plus M plus K. Now, 
we could say, okay, this is quite simple because um, now I, the only thing which is random is xn and xn minus m is k. This is not random. Therefore, I can write instead, this is the same as the sum of all right, g. This is deterministic. Then I place here the expected value times the expected value of xn because the expected value is also a sum. It's the probability, probability density function. But I can change the order times x um, and m. Question is, what is this? Yeah? You see, what we see here is nothing else than shifted autocorrelation function, right? So this is x, x of m minus k. See, here I see still a convolution product. It's a convolution between this impulse response and the autocorrelation function. So this means now we have our result. The cross-correlation between x and y. This is the cross-correlation function. This is just the convolution of our impulse response. Yeah. But now I need to write an index m because I'm talking about the autocorrelation function. Yeah. Um, this is the convolution of g m and x. This is a quite simple result. The cross correlation between x and y is a convolution response with the autocorrelation function. And of course, if you want to calculate this, yeah, this, you have this equation here. So, and now this is a first result. And um, to switch to a slightly different thing, what happens if we change the order in this cross-correlation function? So now we want to obtain, but this is only a small step, by x. So we change the order, cross-correlation between output and input of m. You see, I changed the order. Then we could say x, y. Now how to obtain this is the expected value of, I write it again, xn and yn plus m, cross correlation. And now we just uh, make a substitution and let's say we didn't a s n plus m. Now, therefore, it becomes k minus m. Then I can write this is the same as expected value. Now I substitute this n by minus m times y a. Right. See what is it? Um, this is also um, basically also write this as, let's say, expected y k, right? I just changed the order. y k because I'm interested in this times x minus m, this gives x of minus m. Because now the shift, shift is minus m, right? So this means um, the uh, x, y of m, equal to, this is where we started, x of this is what we open. So, and we can also say in this case, yeah, or um, x of m is the same as our impulse response with minus m. Then we take the function with the autocorrelation. 
this case, if we change the order here, the cross correlation between y and x, still depends on the input equation function with basically the reflected, let's say, uh, response of our field, g of m, g of minus m. This is the next result, and this enables us now to find autocorrelation function at the output. See, this is a quite short step. This is where we are basically interested. Now let's take a look at the autocorrelation function of y process at the output. We can say, okay, we just write the definition again. Expected value of yn is yn. You know it. Just take a look at it. Now we write this is the article of yn times, and now you know some. How do we obtain yn plus m? We obtain it from x. So we say uh, uh, Time continuous convolution, this is the tau again. Yeah? And we can write gk, which is again deterministic, this is the filter impulse response, times x plus m uh, minus k. Plus here, take a look at the output n plus m. We used this before, basically. So, and now we can say again, this gk is deterministic, so we can change the authors of this sum and the expected value and say this is the sum it's gk. Then we have to multiply this with the expected value of yn, see this, times x and n plus k. What is it? We know what it is. It's just our cross correlation function shifted, of course. So this is phi y x. Okay. This is the shift. And you see, this is again basically, yeah, we have the result, so we can say now we obtain. Right. is equal to uh, the convolution of, uh, of m of just insert this is equal to convolution and this is still a convolution product it's involved with this cross correlation function by x of m but we know how to obtain this, where, well, let's say I write it here. This is the upper result, P y x of m is equal to this m. This x of If I insert this, I get an interesting result, because then I get the following result. Autocorrelation auto function, output is equal to, I just changed the order here. Here we see the autocorrelation function at the end. So it's x, x of m to do the convolution with, just use this m yeah, and minus m. Because here we have g minus m. We can change the orders. In it. So gm involved with convolution with g minus m. So this is stochastic. So this is the autocorrelation function at the end. This is the autocorrelation function at the end. And this term here, this is denoted as the pulse autocorrelation function of three points. My original idea was that you calculate, that you exercises 
with this deterministic autocorrelation seminar. Have you done this? Started with this uh, new series? So this is just, we denote this as phi g g. But now we talk about deterministic or inverse responses. Yeah? This is deterministic. And since um, this deterministic signal it's an impossible, but let's denote it as a signal. Um, since this has a limited energy, it's not periodic, it's deterministic, and it has limited energy. We write here for it, it has limited energy. Because we need to use uh, alternative definitions if we talk later about periodic. If you forget this E, it doesn't matter. It's, it's important that you know this is an autocorrelation signal. This is GG of M. Now we have it. This is our result. So at the end, it's like this, phi x, x of M. So it's the autocorrelation. Convolution with the autocorrelation function of Pass response. This is phi. So it's a quite simple result. It's this. this is the result. So autocorrelation function at output, autocorrelation function at input, autocorrelation of pass response. Yeah. So and um, data. Basically, see if we now go in the frequency domain. Going, but this discussion starts in the next subsection. Yeah, go in the frequency domain, get even more insights. Process. I would claim that engineers are more interested in the power spectral density function. But they use the autocorrelation function to obtain the power density. So, and now, because this is discrete time, we cannot use the original discrete Fourier transform. We use here the so called discrete time transform. But I introduce this in the next uh, section. Yeah? This gives, in the frequency domain, our spectral density of our output signal. Our spectral density of this output signal is the spectral density of the input process. Yeah. This is still this discrete time Fourier transform. And a convolution becomes a multiplication in the frequency. You do the Fourier transform or the discrete time Fourier transform of the impulse response, okay, you get G of F transfer function of the field. But if you do the transform of G of minus M, this is G of F complex conjugated. T is real value. We only talk about real valued signals in this section. Okay? So this gives at the end G of let's say times G complex conjugated. What is it? What is a complex number multiplied with a complex conjugated. Magnitude squared, exactly. And maybe, because it's simpler, this was the approach. I just write here times g of f due to the square. Now, if you know what is the purpose, what is the mean of a transfer function, so it's the uh, the ratio between the amplitude spectral density at the output related to the amplitude spectral density in the this is G of F. If you square it, it's the ratio between the power at the output over the frequencies to the power at the input. So this is like a power transfer function because we use magnitude squared. It's not amplitude, it's power. So this is not as, as, uh, quite astonishing, this result. Uh, 
data. And we obtain this from this discrete time for transform. Okay, so now we can switch to this uh, next uh, subsection. This is, um, as you know, 213, power spectral density of a real valued right and stationary probe. So this is power spectral density, power spectral density. Off. Just write it uh, to remember you of real value. Wide sense station. This is the next section. Yeah? And before we talk about uh, power spectral density, we have to introduce this discrete time Fourier transform. Yeah? Do it by doing the transform of the autocorrelation function. But you can also do the transform of a signal, of a discrete time signal, of course. So we just, we define um, the discrete time full form. X so we do it by means of the function it's not a definite um, this is just the approximation discrete time this form and obtain discrete time this form where now we just write it X. So this is the mathematical description of is equal to a sum because now we have discrete time. There is no Fourier integral instead of the int sum. So and this sum goes from white sense stationary uh, WSS. Sorry, white sense stationary. Um, uh, thank you for it. Yeah, it's a mistake. So from minus infinity to infinity, it's x of m. Instead of an integral, a Fourier integral, just have a sum times e to the power of j f t naught. So now take care. Um, if you take a look, for instance, you Google with Wikipedia, take a look at book like Oppenheim. Oppenheim you um, are quite famous. Yeah? But, um, if you have a discrete time signal or a discrete autocorrelation function, everything just depends on this time index. You don't see any absolute time and you don't know the sampling interval. Therefore, often if Discrete time Fourier transform is defined. I just say if I go in the frequency domain, I don't have an absolute time as in the classical Fourier transform where you have here minus j 2 pi f times t. Then they just say because I don't know the absolute time, I use a normalized frequency which is unitless. It's not in hertz. Okay? Then they just, in Oppenheim, they use omega. It's minus j times omega. But this omega is not in radiant per second. Radiant per second, it's just um, unitless. It's just radiant. I could also introduce here, because we don't see any t naught in our phi y y of m or phi x x of m. There is no t naught, right? I could say this is e to the power of minus j, 2 pi f, and 
in this F would be unit. But we do it in a different way, of course, times um, M is still uh, required. There's a shift in the time. And here we simply assume we want to have a frequency with a unit, and we assume that um, a shift here of, uh, say, one sample in this time index corresponds to a real-world time interval of t naught. So we sample the original continuous time process with a sampling interval t naught. Okay. So assume a time interval. T not, yeah, and if you sample a continuous time signal, it's a sampling frequency FS, sampling frequency FS, and the reciprocal value of this sampling frequency is just the time in. And this is what we assume. So for XM or XX of right here, xn, for this. This is just an assumption. By doing this, yeah, we can also use um, alternative definition. Um, write this with this, yeah. Alternative definition. This definition helps us often to easier find discrete time Fourier transform. But and you see, this is exactly the same as before. And the, the approach is simply: um, let's say we have autocorrelation function, and what we are doing is because we want to do the discrete time Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. But this is also valid for any signal. So and I just write here phi x x of m, and we want to do the DFT of phi x x of m. What we are doing is now we assign direct delta pulses, um, and the direct delta pulses are weighted the original values of the autocorrelation function. So we just assign direct delta pulses to these original values, and this is like sampled autocorrelation function. But this is just to obtain to Fourier transform. Now we can use the continuous time Fourier transform. So m times t naught. So this is what I said. We assume time interval t naught, which is the reciprocal value of the sampling frequency, and just assign direct delta pulses. Then we can use the classical Fourier transform uh, to obtain frequency domain description. Yeah, and this, of course, gives exactly the same power spectral density as this approach. Because if you calculate Fourier integral over this expression, yeah, um, integral over each direct delta pulse is just one. Um, without this weighting. And then this integral becomes exactly this sum. So in, some, in, in many cases, it's just easier to use this approach with the classical Fourier transform instead of the D. It's just what I, what I suggest to you what you can do. Now, uh, let's, before we uh, talk about our example, yeah. Let's shortly talk about the inverse um, discrete time Fourier transform. Yeah, Let's say inverse discrete time transform. Um, how could we obtain this? If you take a look at this, it looks like a Fourier series, right? 
exponential oscillations, basically, and these are weighted. This is like a Fourier series. And you look at the definition of the Fourier emissions signal here. Get the next approach. It's clear if you take a look at this power spectral density because the time domain signal is time discrete. The spectrum is always periodic. Usually you draw this uh, spectrum only up to the Nyquist frequency in cases because you know it's periodic. This is, we write it, always periodic. Of course, in the context of discrete time processes, always periodic with period. Not. You can see it here, because this expression is change the frequency, it's a period we see it immediately. So this leads to um, this expression here for the discrete time for its form. So if you obtain, let's say, the autocorrelation function or the time domain signal from the DDFT, uh, expression which looks like expression to obtain Fourier coefficients yeah, for a periodic signal. Fs divided by 2. Is it a one period or multiple periods if you want? Then we insert x or multiply it with plus j. F, of course, we have to normalize by one. Um, if you would assume, you can do this, basically. If you would assume Fs is one, you only work with normalized frequencies. You don't have this term here. So, and then you say, uh, if the frequencies are always normalized, let's say it's the sampling frequency, Nyquist frequency would correspond to one half minus the Nyquist frequency to minus one half. Got the spectrum from minus one half to plus one half. Of so now we can proceed, but before we important further step, if you're only interested in x of zero, if you use the classical inverse Fourier transform, this is the area of the spectrum, total integral. Yeah. Because now our spectrum is periodic. We cannot integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. So the one period lies here by this time, uh, by this uh, F, one by Fn. So this means this is, of course, now we insert zero for this m. This becomes one. So we have to say this is the integral, one period. S of F. You remember, if we talk about autocorrelation, this value here is just the mean power process. So we can obtain the mean power from this power spectral this power spectral this frequency description. This is the, as you know, power, average power, second mode, this from the power. For continuous time processes, this looks like this, phi x x of zero, zero. it's just your integral from minus infinity to infinity, power spectral then, just because it's time discrete in the spectrum. Now, let's go to our old example. Let's say old example. Let's obtain the power spectral density. We have one way to do this. We can start with our phi x. This looks like this. So I, I just start with this. 
this if we throw away sure, and it should work. There was one value which was one half. So this is phi is x of m. This value, I write it as minus one by four. This is one. All the other values are zero. Well, our autocorrelation is only in basically three values. Zero, this is minus one as the index. It's minus one. No values, it's just. If you now just use this um, original approach, yeah, where we use this sum, so it's x of f said insert this value, multiply this by this um, power of but m is zero. Thus now we use this expression. This is the expression. Now I multiply the value at m equal one, just minus one by four minus 1 by 4. So m equal to 1. See if I insert m equal to 1 times t naught. This is times e to the power of j 2. Of course, what you see here is just a shifting theme. One sample is at 0. This gives a constant in the frequency. This value is at Time zero, which corresponds to the time, this gives a constant in the frequency. This is a shifted version, and then we get a new phase term, which is proportional to the frequency. So this shift. And we assume time shift of minus t naught b because we shifted to the right. And then it's one by four. And now we take a look at this. And this is times e to the Plus J. Now we can put this together is equal to one half. Yeah. We have two complex conjugate numbers and make a cosine this complex conjugate numbers. So this means two m minus two times this weighting, which gives one by two. Sine of now we have it. So this is one approach. You can draw a figure. You see in the and in the next lecture, I don't think that we discuss this today, but we then we really see that the power spectral density shows us how the power of the signal is distributed over the frequencies. Therefore, it's denoted as power spectral density. So we can really interpret this. But with the units, we have to be careful if we talk about discrete time. This is not really physical powers. We just have numbers now. So now, what is the period? Period is just 1 by t naught of. You can see this is periodic. I would say this is, let's say, 1 by t naught which is equal to fx, the sampling frequency, this definition of the discrete time form. Then you get, can say um, 1 half minus 1 half is just 0. So at f equal to 0, I get this value. But if this here um, argument is just pi, I get minus 1 times my uh, 1 half. So minus sign, this gives plus one half. So here it's just one this value, right? It's again zero. It's correct of here, this is the cosine. This is this one half. It's here, this is this one half. Then we have to subtract the cosine. This looks like this, basically. This is our distribution. This is like this. 
But again, as I said, yeah. it's clear that this is periodic. And just to interpret this, now we see um, that by using this AMI cup moved here, even the continuous part of the spectrum, and this is the purpose of the AMI. There's no problem in the new world, uh, let's say transmission problems or so, if you would be a direct delta pulse, let's say it, if you happen in some cases, have a DC component in signal, have a direct delta pulse. But the interesting thing is we don't have any continuous part here in the spectrum. And this means if uh, you later assign, let's say, rectangular pulses to this AMI coded data stream, by, for instance, a high pass filter in the transmission channel, still you have significant distortions in your signal. And if you do the same for the original binary but unipolar data stream, you get strong distortions because then the main part of the spectrum is at f equal to zero. The main part of the spectrum is here, as you can see. This is fs by two. This is how it looks like. Now we could say um, just if we compare the characteristics of the autocorrelation function and then of the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, which is the power spectral density, we can here. Say we on, on the left hand we write here the autocorrelation function. Still talk about um, Real value of about the spectral density. We you know the autocorrelation function is in time domain signal or says yeah or signal which which, which is um, Fourier transformed basically is an even function, and the Fourier transform discrete time for transform is always also an even power spectral density is all it's also even because this is real valued any real valued even signal becomes real valued and even the domain as well here we have of course discrete time discrete time if something is discrete time in the time domain, discrete in the time domain, then it's periodic in the domain, so periodic. This helps us a bit. As I said, usually, because we know everything here, draw this up to the Nyquist frequency fs. This is enough. So, now, we can say, um, as a, and the next step, this is one way to obtain um, our result here for this phi xx because we know the autocorrelation function. Another nice way, um, going, uh, let's say we write here as an alternative way. to get this x of f, say. Now we use what we obtain, what we learn in this uh, section. We can say x, x, the autocorrelation function, is equal to solution. Oops. The autocorrelation function of our impulse response, so G, is this abbreviation. So 
autocorrelation function, you can also obtain the autocorrelation function. Now you could say, if I know the D of T of this, so discrete time Fourier transform, and if I know the power transfer function of our delta, can also get pression function times g of m squared. I said we can use a filter to produce this AMI coded data, right? Now let's write this and let's obtain this, uh, let's say, autocorrelation function of our filter. It's quite simple. This is the filter impulse response here. Always alternative words. So I put here uh, uh, n. This is so our response. So this is eta one minus one for this one. Now we did, now again there are two ways ways. We obtain first the autocorrelation function of this response. So what we need to do is Need to do the convolution. Is this version just what do we get? Yes, this. Get here time shift m. And everything what happens happens at then the main value is of two, of course, two. So if I flip this, so g of minus, um, uh, because I want this pulse is at the left hand side. Then if I do the conversion, it's again here. So I get this, this one, plus minus one times minus one, this is two. It's basically like the energy of the signal. So this is two. Value. Then I shift this one step to the right and compare it with its, the origin. So I have this, shift this just one step to the right. Then this pulse is here, get one times minus one. This gives minus one. Shift of one. So one, this value is minus one. Of course, the autocorrelation function is always an even function. I also get this minus one in the autocorrelation function, and the shift minus one. And all the other values are zero. Basically, you compare this impulse response with its own shifted version. Shifted version at m equal to zero would look like this, right? The same. So one times one minus time, one times minus one. And then I shift this one step to the right or to the left, it's here, and minus one times one gives minus one, sum up everything, because all the other values are zero, and I get minus one. And I shift this, if I shift this to the left, this point, same result, right? It's quite easy to obtain this. This would be relation function. This is Now, just one, one further, uh, just one minute, because I am basically interested in g of f magnitude squared. So this in the Fourier transform, uh, in the in the domain, is with time. This gives g. Now, how can we obtain this? Now, I can use two methods, either. I do the Fourier transform of this. This would be probably, it's a, it's a good, very good way. We could do this. Yeah. Um, because um, now we have everything. We get basically what we get is, of course, two. It's this constant. Yeah. Minus one times e to the power of minus j2 plus t naught. Yeah. Minus one times e to the power of plus j2 pi. T naught. And what we get is, of course, uh, 2 minus 2 times cosine of ft. We have the result. This is 
Okay, this is a result of our power transfer function. Now, if we multiply this power spectral density of our original differentially encoded data stream with this power transfer function, also get power spectral density of our AMI coded data stream. This also needs to give this phi xx of f. You can try it at home to find starting with this autocorrelation function to find this power spectral density. And I suggest, maybe you, you try it really. I, says, I, I suggest to you to do this by means of the Fourier transform. So you know we talk about discrete time processes. We only have numbers. But you say, now I want to use, in order to obtain the power spectral density, I, I assign direct delta pulses yeah, to the original values of this discrete time uh, uh, autocorrelation function. Let's say this is one half. This value then is always one by four. One by four. So in the time step between T naught. So this is if we assign direct delta pulses to our original values and so on. This is by T naught. Now the advantage is that this is a time. You can use the classical, maybe I just write the result, the classical Fourier transform to obtain the power spectral density of this um, differentially encoded data stream. And this looks like this, of course. But now we have direct delta pulses in the spectrum. This makes it a little bit more complicated. It's just a sum. So I suggest this approach, go in the frequency domain. What we obtain now is it's this one. We need to multiply this with this. This looks as, our, as this figure, right? Here, one half minus one half cosine, and here we have two minus two times cosine. Now look how this spectrum looks. There is one component with this constant. This is this one half, a direct, direct data pulse with a weighting of one half it's in the spectrum, just constant. And the weighting is by four. Why? Because this direct delta pulse here is twice with the weighting of one by four. There are basically two direct delta pulses, each with a weighting of one by four. And now look, one by four multiplied by this four as the largest value of the transfer function just gives one, which we had here. Multiply this. And then a sequence of direct delta pulses becomes a sequence of direct delta pulses even in the frequency domain. You may draw this like this. Here's a direct delta here is a direct delta pulse, a direct delta pulse here, and so on. So we have direct delta pulses. And the spacing is one by T naught. But if I multiply the direct delta pulses with this oscillating transfer function, they disappear. They are exactly at multiples of T naught. And there is no direct delta pulse at zero because this function is zero at F to zero. So we end up exactly with this function, right? So the direct delta pulses disappear. Of course, you can write a value here, this direct delta times, um, now I have to think, uh, we need to apply this here, it's one by four, additionally fs, so one by t naught. This is just a characteristic of the Fourier transform. Here the weighting is one by four of this sequence, here it becomes one by four times the spacing in the frequency domain. But these direct delta pulses, if I multiply this by this function, okay, you can, if you um, say I don't have enough, just skip this, I just draw this function, yeah, if this function, this, this, this g of f square, and then this, yeah, say here, this is this, let's say, 
2, this is 4, this is 2, and this is G. Of Okay, it's not in the same back here one T not. It's, it's not uh, same spacing as here. Here we have two rectangles. Here I have four. Rectangles. Here it's F, and then I get a. As you see, if I multiply both. This with this result is only this continuous part of the spectrum remains. One by four times four is just one. And we learned how to obtain the autocorrelation function at the output of a field. It's really important. So we have seen, yeah, in the frequency domain, we have to multiply the uh, spectrum at the input with the transfer function to the square. Square. This is really, these are absolutely important results. And in the next lecture, yeah, this helps us to understand why the power of spectral density describes the distribution of the power. Use exactly the same method. Uh, professor, one question. Yes? Uh, the G of F, um, the power of G of F, like uh, at zero at frequency, it will be zero, I guess. It is minus so, cos sorry, theta. Sorry, I, I've, I, I've drawn it completely wrong. Okay. Because there was not enough time. Yeah, yeah and I <laughs> got yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was not enough time. Sorry for this. This was a good comment. Here it's zero. It's one. Here it's zero. Zero. Here it's one. Here it's zero. It's like this. This was the goal. Very good comment like this, of course. These things happen if you don't have enough. But now it's clear, I hope. It's, it, it has the same shape here as this. Of course, this shaping yeah, comes just from the... So the, the power spectral density of the original data would be the continuous part of the original data differentially encoded is constant. This AMI coding, which can be obtained by filtering to shape the spectrum. This is the idea. Fiber optics. You realize this filter not by a digital filter, you realize this in the optical domain just by so called, uh, it, it looks like an interferometer. Yeah? So you have a direct path where the light can propagate, then you have a uh, path where you introduce a delay of one bit, optical path, and you just uh, add a tiny delay which corresponds to a phase shift of pi on your optical carrier. And if your optical carrier it was originally cosine, then it's now minus cosine, and you add both, you get zero. This is how do you basically optimize minus one. It's, it's realized by a so-called delay interferometer by analog component to filter. Spacing, there is a, a time delay between these two ranges of your... You may have heard about Mach interferometer. Or, I just, but this is side information. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I hope you understand this. Yeah.